All right, hello everyone. Um, I'll be uh, coordinating the lightning talks. Uh, we have about 10 speakers and uh, we have at our, at our disposal uh, about an hour. Uh, so it's six minutes uh, per speaker, as we uh, as, a, as we already mentioned in the schedule. Uh, so uh, let's begin. Uh, the first speaker is Miroslav Suki. Yep, perfect. With uh, Mock, what's new? Uh, the next speaker is, is uh, Juan Argua, RPM PI installer. Perfect. He should be uh, prepared uh, right afterwards. And uh, yep. Okay, hi, hi everybody. Uh, so, who doesn't know me? Uh, I'm Miroslav Suchy, and I would like to share just what's new in Mock. Uh, there are some interesting new features. Uh, uh, first of all, there's a uh, feature dash dash force arc, which will allow you to instantly get a different architecture on your hand. So, if you write Mock shell, dash dash force arc uh, uh, PPC 64 uh, LE, you will get in, after downloading few packages, uh, PowerPC packages, you will have PowerPC machine. Uh, that's just like one minute or two minutes. You can do the same for arc, arc 64, uh, any, any architectures. The slowdown is just a little bit. Uh, the installation is like, uh, instead of SSD disk, uh, you, you have back my, like magnetic disk, uh, and that's all. Uh, everything else is handled by Kvemu. Uh, you, you just have to have installed Kvemu user static, uh, and uh, uh, emulation is done, software, uh, software emulation. It's work like charm. So if you need to do something for foreign uh, architectures, uh, use this, uh, it's much faster than uh, creating a new virtual machine, just if you need to some, something develop. Other interesting feature is Bootstrap. It's in Mock for more, uh, for one year, uh, and uh, it's still not enabled by default because there are some glitches, but it's good to know that it's there. The feature comes like, uh, if you are on, let's say, RHEL 6 or RHEL 7 and you want to install a Rawhide on RHEL 7, you don't have YUM. Uh, so what to do? There were some uh, mm, uh, things we will like, try magically do, but uh, Bootstrap is more me better solution because it will install very minimal uh, root which install only DNF, RPM, and distribution GPG keys, and that's all. Uh, and from this root, we will install the final root with the Federa 28 or uh, Rawhide. So you will have the final root installed with the DNF from that distribution you are going to install, which is uh, awesome. And right now, it's currently only possible way how you can install Federa 28 on RHEL 7 because of some uh, rigid dependencies used in some packages, uh, which comes to point, if you are maintaining some package which is used by RPM, DNF, brings or Python, etc., please <clears throat> don't try to use some uh, uh, or any new RPM features Otherwise, even this feature will not help us to build Fedora 32 or something like that. So uh, in future, please try to not use any fancy RPM feature in those minimal uh, uh, RPMs. So, but otherwise, everywhere you can use any feature as, as you like, and Bootstrap will be solution for you to build that package on any uh, supported platform. That's all. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jun Aruga. So, I have six minutes for my presentation. 
So today, what I want to share for you is about uh, one product recently I developed. Uh, that is a installer to install RPM Python binding in any Python environment. Uh, I want to ask you uh, how many people uh, you know uh, RPM Python binding? Raise your hands. Okay, oh, that's cool. So actually, uh, for example, uh, Koji or some uh, Fedor package command, R package command is using RPM Python binding. Uh, the main purpose for the binding is to purpose RPM spec file. But uh, the, some challenging is people want, sometimes want to use RPM Python binding on, for example, a virtual environment to develop uh, your project using uh, RPM Python binding. Uh, and this installer uh, some solves the problem. Uh, and some people want to use uh, RPM Python binding uh, on, for example, uh, Python 3.5, not 3.6. Uh, RPM Python binding is provided by RPM uh, for uh, Python 3.6, but people want to use for different versions. And on CentOS, uh, the Python binding for Python 3 is not provided, but still people want to use uh, and my installer to solve this problem. Uh, oh, still, we have three minutes. <laughs> and the main architecture is, uh, ah, the main benefit is if your project uh, needs RPM Python binding as a runtime dependency, uh, your project maybe cannot upload to PyPy remote server, right? Because uh, RPM Python binding is not uh, published as a PyPy package. But using this installer, you can uh, publish your package uh, to PyPy server. You can publish. And actually, the Koji is using this technology. So you can publish your Python application to PyPy server. Uh, so main architecture is uh, some, uh, for example, PyPy, uh, no, no, PIP install RPM dash PY dash installer. So in this uh, timing, the application will get source code of RPM and only build a part of Python binding not entire RPM. So that is the main architecture. So that enables to build RPM Python binding on any version of the Python. So, uh, yeah, you can use it. And still I have two minutes. What was the name of the project? Okay, <laughs> the name is RPM-PY-Installer. RPM dash py dash installer. Just remember the name. And you can search this name on GitHub or uh, PyPy uh, website. Uh, so, uh, any questions? <laughs> uh, two minutes, I see. Mm, mm. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Uh, okay, so it's done. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. The next speaker is uh, Luca Bruno. Uh, his talk is uh, Ignition First Boot CoreOS Provisioning. I thought that was somebody else before, but okay. Um, hi, my name is Luca. I used to work at CoreOS before. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you about Ignition, which is something that we did um, 
as a new project, let's say, to solve a few issues. Uh, and I'm gonna let you guess uh, what are the design uh, this is the data, let's say. <laughs> what are the design details or the design goals that we are aiming for? Um, so first, we were running cloud init at some point. And the problem is we want to configure the machine, the cloud machine or the bare metal machine uh, when they are starting up for the first time. Um, but we have a problem with cloud init. And I'm gonna guess you, and I'm gonna let you guess you, um, what are these problems? Um, like, in which language is cloud init written? Have you ever used cloud init first? How many of you had? A few. In which language is Cloud Init written? Python. Okay. What do you need in order to run a Python binary? Python. Mm -hmm. And? Uh, okay. And then just the interpreter, nothing else? Libraries. Sun libraries. Cool. So where are the interpreters and libraries living in this machine? Haha. Uh -huh. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so that means that now you want to package and manage Python interpreters and Python libraries and tell people, hey, this is the library that we provide you. Cool. Problem is, in our operating system, we don't have an interpreter and the Python libraries, so not good. Um, and then the other thing is, what do you configure with cloud in it? A lot of stuff, including, I don't know, network configuration, right? Cool. Where is the user data for cloud in it coming from? Network. Somewhere outside in the network. So. How do you do it? Well, you run some network, then you get the configuration, then you reconfigure the network, and then you hope that there is nothing else racing with you in order to do something with the network, because then it's like, well, there is a network, now there is not anymore, down there is the network, down. It's configured in a different way. Um, and this is exactly why we wrote Ignition. Um, so Ignition is basically a replacement for Cloud Init, and also a bit for like Kickstart, Anaconda, same kind of like ideas. Um, and the main difference is that it's not written in Python, it's written in Go, so it's just a single binary. Um, it doesn't allow you to do a lot of things in a like, non-declarative way, so you cannot run any arbitrary comments or whatever. Uh, instead, it is supposed to be a machine interface, so you generate some JSON according to some JSON scheme, and that's a declarative configuration on how does the machine looks like when it is, once it is provisioned. Um, and then Ignition just takes it from somewhere, the network or whatever, um, and it does all the configuration before the machine boots in the initramfs, before the real switch to the real rootfs. Um, and so at this point we have a deterministic pro process where the machine boots, it does some Ignition configuration. If that declarative configuration is actually applied, then the machine boots. If that declarative configuration is not valid or cannot be applied for any reason, then the machine doesn't proceed with the normal boot and it is stuck at the initramfs with some errors that you can inspect. Um, and after some time, it's gonna reboot and try to reprovision again. Um, and that's the main idea for, for Ignition. That's the main point why we did it and that's the main point why we have this uh, not invented DR syndrome which in this case is more like um, we have different design goals and different design details uh, and we wanted to, to actually solve tickets um, and bug reports that people were, were reporting to us. Um, and that's it. And I'm speaking about Ignition because that's actually one of the components that we like that we want to carry over from, from Container Linux and that's gonna be part of our uh, how to provision Fedora CoreOS in the future. Questions? Um, so we don't have any performance uh, goal at all, but the goal that we have is like race-free and correctness provisioning. So it's like, as a side effect, it may be faster. It depends on what you're doing. Uh, the thing is like with Ignition, you can basically provision whatever. So if you, are, if you want to fetch a three gigabytes files before the machine boots, it's gonna be slow depending on the network, but that's the details. Other question? Somebody cut me a six minutes, please. <laughs> I'm not counting. Go. So, uh, uh, nothing I've heard or seen about uh, addition to the engine's specific justification for maintainers and users of Flawless. Um, would it be better as a replacement for CloudInit or able to take in like CloudInit that makes you just better at so, it? Um, yep. So, the question is like, can we port contain, um, Ignition to other random? distribution, so the answer is yes and no. Um, the yes part is yes, it's just a binary, a static binary that takes some JSON and does some, up, some, some operations. Um, so that part, yes, like packaging it for Fedora was not too hard. Um, the hard part is that it 
it is really designed, it was really designed in order to fit into the container Linux bootstrapping process that assumes a lot of things are like read-only, there are no packages, there are no many things, and you can like boot, do some stuff, and then continue with the boot. Um, and that's the R part. So like the integration with Dracat and DiniTramFS for every single distribution is probably gonna look different depending on the, on the real distribution. Apart from that, no, it's just like a Go binary that takes JSON and does some stuff, uh, and that's it. Like right now in Fedora Core S, we don't do any. So Ignition can do disk partitioning and disk manipulation, but right now in Fedora Core S, I think we still don't do that because that assumes the old container Linux setup where you have two user partition, a, re a read write um, root file system, and so on and so forth. So that's gonna take a bit more time, I guess. Other question? Last one? No. Um, I cannot answer completely to that. It supports some of the same providers, um, some of the same methods of fetching it, mostly like the remote endpoint metadata. And then depending on specific providers, some local, like local disk or a local firmware configuration or whatever, I didn't check all the providers including, so I don't know. But we support everything for like AWS to bare metal to GCP to all the other clouds. Uh, one. One like dark corner is VirtualBox, and that's something that we are going to work on. Apart from that, it's mostly okay everywhere. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Luca. The next speaker is Praven um, Kunov with uh, Fedora ISO for Mind. Yep. <laughs> I have some, some slides for that. So um, my name is Parveen Kumar. I work for Red Hat in a developer tools uh, group. And uh, I'm talking about the project which I work usually on Minishift. Um, this is the way to provision an um, OpenShift cluster locally uh, with the single node cluster. And I'll talk about like why we are doing it and why we are using Fedora. So. So um, Minishift, we say it's run OpenShift locally. Um, this is a basic architecture how Minishift actually works. So we use something called libmachine. And uh, libmachine is actually manage the VM uh, lifecycle for the Minishift. And using the uh, Minishift, we actually create a VM using the native uh, hypervisor on the system. Like for Linux, we use KVM, Windows, we use Hyper-V. And for the Mac, we use Exive. And then we use the, the OpenShift client binary, which actually internal do the OC cluster up, and then it OC cluster up actually deploy the single node OpenShift cluster for us. Um, we already have some existing ISO for you know try out and and in the VM. So we have CentOS, we have something called Boot to Docker ISO, and we had a Minikube ISO, uh, which we deprecated because it was not working as we expected to work. So we deprecated it, I assume. Uh, why we want to use the Fedora? Um, very simple way that uh, now there are a lot of different container technology which coming into the picture, like it's Podman is there, Cryo is there, Builda is there. And we also wanted to use the same thing. Um, right now, OC cluster up doesn't have the, uh, the option to actually select the different container runtime. Uh, it still use the Docker as a default, but even then, if a user want to like try out some some command with the Podman or some command with the Cryo, he can do the he can log into the SSH to the VM, which is very easy uh, for the Minishift because it's already there. He just do Minishift SSH and then try out all the commands. Okay, uh, somebody will say that yeah, I I'm already using Fedora. Then what's the use for it? Because I can directly run OC cluster up on my own laptop and then I have the local. Um, OpenShift cluster up and running. So, um, so yes, you can do that. Um, it, it, it's good if you are only 
uh, try to use only single uh, OpenShift version. Like, um, if I want to use like OpenShift v 3.6.1, and tomorrow if 3.6.2 is released, um, with OC cluster up, I can only provision one single um, OpenShift cluster on my own laptop. But if you are using MiniShift, what we have is something called profile. Um, <coughs> so what it do is that each profile can have a different version of OpenShift, so you can actually test your application across whatever the version you want to select. Uh, then how to build that that the ISO which we are using. So um, we use the kickstart file the old way. Um, we already have a GitHub repository and uh, I was having a talk with uh, Mohan and uh, we want to make it part of the Fedora. And then what we'll do is that once we have it then with the official way we can release that ISO. Um, but I, I have a locally built ISO myself. So this is how it actually looks like, right? If you do SSH, you can check what's the, open, the, what's the Fedora version I'm using. So if you don't believe on the screenshot, I have to go to the terminal, try, try it out. But I don't know how much time we have, but yeah. And then uh, what if I have some issue? Uh, so we are on the free node called Minishift. Uh, we have a mailing list. We have an uh, issue tracker, and uh, we we think that we have very good documentations around what we do, but if you still think that uh, there is some confusion around the documentation, uh, let us know. We, we have some dedicated person for the documentation, so um, that's, that's it. Are we good on time? Yeah. Ah, okay, so if you have any questions, yeah? Sorry, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so the the default we use uh, for the VM is like two GB of RAM and twenty GB of disk space. But that that actually depends on the application. So, some of the people who are actually using MiniShift, if they want to deploy the application, which are like more resource hungry, so they usually use like four GB or six GB of RAM, and then. But for the for the user who want to just play around the OpenShift, see how it works, I think that's the best what we have. So, so we, this this is the live ISO. So, so, so the disk size, right? The disk there's a there's a uh, standard persistent disk we create like 20 GB or whatever the user give. That's we what we do is that we mount in the live ISO. So, whatever written in the disk until unless you delete that VM, that is there always. So you can stop and start, and your application is up and running. But if you do delete, then then it will be like nothing will be there. So you have to. Okay. But the, the, the good thing is that we also have something called host folder mount, which we use SSFS. So you can actually mount your host to the VM and have it like everything, whatever you need for persistence should be there. So that way. So what is the target for the Fedora level That will be basically uh, yeah, uh, Uh, no, uh, so so the thing is that if we want to make it an Amazon image, I think uh, uh, th because the content is not different what the Fedora supposed the Fedora default Amazon image have, so it it just doesn't make sense. But what we want for the developer is that um, if they want to try out Minishift on your local host, they can use that ISO and try it out. With the uh, I didn't. I I can talk about that. Thank you. Thanks. Next one is uh, Paul Frills. Is he here? Nope. Okay, let's skip that for now. Uh, Jonathan, uh, with uh, what is? Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hey, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Sorry, I'm just going to try and make that a bit taller. Okay, if any of you guys have been talking to me, you'll know that right now the, the thing I've been working on is Zchunk, and I'm looking out here, and I think probably about half of you guys have had to bear the burden of listening to me go on and on and on about this. So, I just thought I'd do it as a quick lightning talk. What is Zchunk? Why do you guys care? Most of you probably don't, 
but let's get into it anyway, and maybe some of you guys will think, hey, this is awesome. Z-Chunk is a new compression format, and you guys are like, why on earth do we need a new one? We've got about 10 of them, right? Well, the thing is, Z-Chunk is not actually a new compression format. It's reusing another compression format. In fact, it can use different compression formats, but what it is, it is a method of compressing files where you split the files into independent chunks. And the reason you do this is so that when you are wanting to download a new version of the file, you are not stuck downloading the whole file again. Uh, a zchunk file can be created uh, using the zck command in the same way that you might use the xz command or gzip command. It can be decompressed using the unxz command, uh, sorry, unzck command in the same way gunzip or unxz. But the, the, there is an extra tool there called zck download that will, if you give it a older version of the file and you point it at the new file on the internet, it will download only the chunks that have changed. And this gets you, depending on how big the differences are in the files, this can get you some rather dramatic uh, uh, reduction in the amount that you download. So why am I talking about this, this here? We are looking to Zchunk Fedora's metadata. Uh, the, the metadata that you guys download every single time you run DNF update and you're looking at that beautifully long bar that goes and moves and moves. And if you're like me, trying to do this over 3G sometimes, it's moving very, very slowly. Using Zchunk, you can go and download only the differences. Where are we at? Uh, this, uh, this was a feature we proposed for Fedora 29. Um, the bad news is it will not be completely done for Fedora 29. My goal is to have the metadata generated uh, for Fedora 29 and Fedora 30, there will be opt-in testing for people who are interested in risking their lives and their ability to update. And, uh, and yeah, assuming that everything works out well, we can make it a all-in for Fedora 30. Um, I've got implementation details, but honestly, I think at this point I'll open it up for questions. Yes. In, I ran some tests. Um, basically, the results are you have to, de the, the Z chunk file has two parts a header that stores the checksums of the chunks, and then the body, which is the actual chunks themselves. You have to download the header every single time. So you're looking at a minimum, like on uh, primary.xml, you're looking at a minimum of, of maybe 50 to 100K that you're going to download every single time. And then on top of that, it's the difference in on a day where like if you use it every single day you might be looking at an additional 50k out of whereas the normal primary.xml is maybe three to four megabytes so drop that down to one or 200k uh, including the header there um, if you're if you're taking longer in between updates you're going to see much larger uh, you're going to have to download a whole lot more in the back, yeah. The chunk size uh, varies. Um, with we're using a uh, we're using a couple of different ways of generating the chunk size. With um, with Z chunk, you can actually manually end a chunk wherever the heck you want to. Uh, the key thing is that you always do it in a consistent manner. So in create repo, when we're ending the chunk, we are ending the chunk at the end of every single package. So, well, actually, every source, we try and combine uh, packages that have the same source RPM together into the same chunk because there's not much point in putting them in separate chunks. We do use uh, compression dictionaries, which means the size of the file, the, the compression we get is still very, very good. It normally beats gzip by about 10%. Um, what does this mean for, okay. Right now, it means absolutely nothing. I have a vision. I don't know if, if I've told you this, but I have a vision. And any, is there anybody who works in, on RPM here? OK, please don't shoot me. My vision right here, my vision is to kill Dart, Delta RPMs with fire, OK? And instead, make 
RP, uh, make Z-Chunk uh, a payload for RPMs, okay? There are some issues there because you have the, file, the information on the file system is uncompressed. I have some ideas on Z-Chunk has the ability to do feature flags. So I have some ideas on how you can still validate that the, the information you're getting off the file system is the same. You're looking very suspicious at me right now, and I don't blame you. Um, but yeah, what, I do have a vision for how this could completely destroy the need for ever using Delta RPMs again. And I, I was the one who worked on getting them in originally, and I love them, except I hate them. So they're, you know, it's kind of a, yeah. So kind of related to that, what is the server load for a compose that includes the Z-Chunk? All it is is, is you know, when you're, uh, for create repo C, when you're, create, when you're compressing the, the the file, you're just compressing the file. There's not, in in the whole eight and a half hour compose cycle, it might take a little, the, the compression level we're using, it might take a little bit long, another minute, another right two minutes. Like two or three hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, well, and if we could get rid of this, it would, it would be increasing the time it takes to create, it would actually be moved to Koji because it's when Koji would create the RPM, you would be, in, uh, the compressing the RPM would take longer. But the beauty of Z-Chunk is we don't have to know the old version. Delta RPMs, we have to know the old version and the new one, Delta in between them. Z-Chunk, it's up to the client to work out what it wants to grab. Thank you. Next one is uh, Dan Horak. Perfect. And after that is Floria, then Marie, and then Adam. So, hello. I guess you know me. I'm Dan Horak, working on the alternative architectures, primarily on the IBM ones. And the lightning talk is about, yeah, using an open power workstation or system as a workstation for daily use. Uh, yeah, the answer is yes. You can use a uh, non-mainstream architecture as a daily workstation. I personally use it with XFCE. Uh, there are still some issues uh, with those 3D graphics uh, needed for GNOME. Uh, but uh, yeah, the community is collecting uh, the issues. Uh, they are trying to find the fixes uh, and yeah, get everything upstream. So yeah, should work fine. Uh, actually, uh, the workstation or uh, the Talos workstation that's based on the IBM or Open Power or Nine CPUs uh, is a result of the uh, Open Power Foundation effort. Uh, it's based on a reference design improved uh, by the Raptor Computing Systems Company. Uh, one of the goals uh, they had, uh, it's not only to yeah, provide some non-mainstream architecture, it was not the primary goal. Uh, the primary goal was rather uh, to have an owner-controllable uh, system, which means that uh, with uh, the open power system, you have all firmwares uh, on GitHub, so you can compile it yourself, really from the beginning for uh, the Talos workstation or the Talos systems, you also have uh, sources for a system P uh, FPGA with, uh, which does some power on stuff uh, really to, to power up the system. Uh, there is also a second computer inside <laughs> the system, which is uh, the management one, the BMC, that also runs uh, fully open source operating systems, open BMC, also on GitHub. So yeah. It's here, it's usable. Uh, there were some benchmarks uh, done by the Foronix guys. Uh, they discovered some issues or performance issues, uh, I think primarily in the multimedia stuff. Uh, and immediately after they published the results, uh, there were some other guys and teams who picked the challenge and started to work on improving the stuff for power. So we should get, uh, yeah, even in these areas, uh, at least comparable performances uh, on Intel or AMD systems. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I do more. My 
workshop wasn't accepted, so I didn't brought uh, my system with me, so I cannot show it to you. So yeah, it's probably all from me. So any questions? Uh, for what parts you mean here? Right. For what parts of the architecture? It's a IBM Power. It's a Power PC, the server architecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the main, main development I'm thinking about. Is, is you, you mean? Like, how can I check the integrity of my system? Uh, for your project oh. or any project? Yeah, there are some. Uh, projects uh, in progress. Uh, we are working with the CentOS guys to um, yeah, start some infrastructure inside the CentOS CI uh, to allow upstreams to yeah, run the CI on, on, on the infrastructure we have. Or we also have some other virtual machines that we can uh, give uh, developers uh, access to and they can run their own instances of uh, they are CI system they want. So yeah, definitely it's possible. Just talk to me or talk to CentOS guys. We can definitely figure out some solution. Yeah, Brian has some plans for getting uh, airspace support into the front end. Yeah, that these architectures should be possible with the CentOS CI. Uh, the other architecture we care about in Fedora, the s the mainframe, it's a bit more difficult, but we have also solution, or we had a solution, I think, uh, if, uh, two weeks before, and hopefully the next week uh, it will be back because yeah, the so machine we used uh, or the hypervisor somehow died and they are reinstalling it, so should be back again. So, any more questions? No, so thank you. And Next one is uh, Floria Festi, uh, changelog git messages. So the question of uh, what to do with the git changelog has come up a couple of times. People have been annoyed of being doing changelog in the spec file and then having to type it again into git. And um, it, every time you try to have some changes and put it in another branch, it also gives a huge merge conflict. It's a pain. And I was always, was in my back of my mind, so what to do with that? And, but I didn't really figure out what could be done. I mean, yeah, someone just write a script to create a change log, then use include, and don't bug, don't bug RPM developers with your stupid details. Um, <laughs> but it's still kept in my mind, and so I was under the shower, and my, my, my brain cooled back to a working state, and it made, it made click, and I, I realized the problem is actually not the change log itself, there, the problem is all those merge conflicts. And those merge conflicts are actually not really created by the change log. They're actually created by the version, actually the release number, which is annoyingly getting changed every time in a different way. And so I figured the only way to actually move the change log out of the spec file in a way that it actually reduces all those uh, merge conflicts is to move the release number out with it. That's basically the only way to actually get rid of that. And so I was wondering, can this be done? So I wrote a small Python script, and that basically does this. And it, the idea is basically this. You need like a couple of commands that you can put into the uh, message log. And the one is, of course, the default is that take this message, use the user, use the date, create a, ch a change log entry out of this. The, na the next thing is, well, where do we get the version number actually from this? And this, the, the thing what you need is, you need to need when the version change, and then you just count the release numbers up from that. So the package doesn't even have to do anything when changing something. You just commit, and it magically updates your release number. This has the great 
saying that if you have a change, move, grab it from here and put it there, it will just increase the, the number and you don't have to care that they're actually not the same because they're not even in there. So you need a way basically to, to tell the script when the version changes so, so it knows where to start counting. And so I basically said, well, we just, whenever the change log says update to, we just grab that. That's one, one solution. You could, of course, also just parse the spec file, but you parse the spec file, which has parts missing, which you're trying to create, which probably works if you like, be nice to it. But I'm not quite sure yet what's, what's the right thing to do there, but there are basically the two options. One is, well, leave the actual version in there and parse it out, or basically put it in Git also, and probably epoch to as if you think about it a bit more. Um, there are probably two more features that are needed. One is like ignore those mess this message. We really don't want to see it um, because it's just a rebuild or it's something where we put the wrong thing in there. Um, and there you need another thing that's basically saying, well, start generating the change log from this point on to the future. So you basically can keep all the other stuff. And the nice thing is if you're using include, you can bas basically keep the change log you already have, put an include line on top, and so basically only use the regenerated change log from that point on. Um, then there's another, so I had this working. It kind of looks like it could be a thing. Um, there's one more problem, and the problem is um, Git history. Basically, yeah, someone at some point will fuck up something, and you don't want to go back and basically change all the history. So the question is what to do with that. And the, th the obvious only, the only obvious solution is, well, we misuse text to basically do the same type of commands which can be applied to uh, changes in, in, uh, later on. Basically, just put a tag on that says, well, ignore this message, or, well, actually, we changed the version here. So it could even be done for older, uh, for all the history that we want to convert if we really want to, which we probably don't. So that, that's the idea. It's not really there yet. I'm not really sure. I mean, it, 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 it has a couple of problems, obviously, because you have like spec files which are no longer self-contained, which will probably break the build system everywhere, which I don't care because I'm an RPM developer and I just don't care. <laughs> 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 but uh, so, that's one way that can be done, and it probably can be done without even new features in RPM right now. There may be some things we can help. Talk to me. That's basically it. The next one is uh, Marie, uh, Budgie's micro brainstorming. She yeah. will tell you. I think the. Yeah. Uh, I don't need to plug in. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marie. Oh. Hi, I'm Marie Norden, and I am the Fedora Badges Design Maintainer. So really quick, I just want to have a discussion with you guys. Um, I'm going to give you some prompts, and then like we can talk about, get some new ideas. So what is something you do all the time for Fedora that you want to get a badge for? What is something you might be working on that you need more help or contributions for? What are some areas or projects of Fedora you think that we need more people working on in general? Are you working on anything new that we can create badges for? And then any other just general ideas are also welcome, but I ask you to be as specific as possible because I'm going to open the issues later <laughs> and I might not know as much as about that topic as you do. So go ahead. I'm going to take notes. Bugzilla. Bugzilla. <laughs> 
I thought we had a lot of tickets open for that, but it wasn't possible. Is it possible now? Yes. <laughs> Bugzilla hooking it up with Fed message? Yeah? Well, Okay, so anything that was previously marked as not possible for Bugzilla is now possible. Theoretically. Okay. And also, uh, apparently Bugzilla 5 is going to test so with Pat, so that doesn't even matter either. All right, so I will take a uh, revisit some of those issues. Or anyone else? What do you feel? Oh, oh, it's okay. I will note that, but that is not my job. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's fair enough. I'm going to take a note. Go ahead. Module builds. Okay. What about module builds? So we have this new thing called the Lumpy Lumpy, where you can build packages into groups. Okay. And we can get packages for building these groups. So a series of building packages for module builds. Is that what I did? I get that right? A yes. series of badges. Yes. Okay. All right. Um. <laughs> okay. So that's not specific. That's very general. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dusty. Okay. Okay, Rust group, Go Link group. Sure. Do we have one for that? Or I think there's a ticket open regarding silver blue but I don't know if it's for membership or being part of the group <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't quite hear you can speak up I'm just gonna take a note I'm gonna have to look into that so converting Python package from two to three Okay. Matt? We have a new thing that's being worked on in my chair for right now. It's going to be a Fedora ambassador, so that's fairly heavyweight. We have a new, I think it's Fedora advocate thing where if you want to have like a hundred dollar party of some sort, we will give you a hundred dollars. So this Fedora advocate. So you ran a hundred dollar party? Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's a pretty good one. All right. Discourse? Yeah, so we, we have three new open tickets. We made them yesterday. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else? Dusty? Okay. Which is not necessarily what you're responsible for, but No, but I could still open a ticket and we can the discuss. That, the analog of that is we could actually create a some sort of fed message bridge between the people mentioned Ask
that's oh yeah that could get abused a little bit <laughs> I mean it's a cool idea yeah I'm just gonna mark that one as this is a bad idea <laughs> So where would we put that? Like, how would that? Mm. Probably in badges at the end. You'd probably just put it there and say, like, when you're looking at the profile, they'll say, well, you were in the running to get these badges. This is how close you are. Right? OK, so yeah, I like that. You're in the running for XYZ badge. You need this many more. Anything else? I'm sensing that this is about to be over. All right, thanks. Okay, and last but not least, Adam Samalik. Yes, I'm using macOS to make Fedora better. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, yeah, I know that's a horrible title and I apologize and feel free to just shout boo. But yes, I <laughs> but sometimes I, I use a Mac and sometimes I'm just stuck with my Mac and I want to work on Fedora and I don't want to, for example, carry two laptops or do whatever. So I just use it to contribute. And I'm also using on my Lenovo laptop a Fedora Atomic Workstation, which is now called uh, Silver Blue. And I've noticed something very similar. So on Silverblue, I do everything in containers. And on my Mac, I do everything in containers. And I somehow notice that I don't care which one I use because it's the same. I use the same commands, the same workflows, the same everything. And then I was wondering, we want to attract more contributors. And like the first thing we want to say, uh, we don't want to say is just reinstall your laptop. I feel like that's a bit high bar for new people. So if we can make it possible for people using Macs, because there are many developers from, with using Macs, to contribute to Fedora and maybe onboard them and make them packaging or whatever, because they can be contributing to server or anything else. And then maybe switch them over so we can say, hey, if you switch, the containers will run not natively, so it'll be faster for you. Or you can customize it. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. So if we could, as for example, part of the silver blue, um, build a consistent experience for both. So that's just an idea we could maybe work with. And by the way, funny thing, um, if I'm doing a graphical design in Inkscape, I always choose Fedora, which is ironic because on Mac it's so slow, it's almost unusable. So, and Macs are usually seen as like a graphical laptop. So no, Fedora is the go-to graphical laptop for me. And I think that's all. Um, any questions or boos? I mean, or boos? Yeah, uh, if we build, uh, if we build it for, if we build it really nice for people to, for example, build containers based on Fedora, they might just choose Fedora just for this instead of other distributions available, <laughs> um, <laughs> which are. So I have a question there. You next. So, so what I'm basically proposing is kind of like hand wavy, but. The project Silverblue is about building container experiences for developers using Fedora. So you do everything in containers. Um, 
that's an OS, but can we build the exact same experience on Mac OS and Matthew, don't hate me, and call it Fedora? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Then part of that effort, their workflows containerized, our tooling gets better around containerized workflows. Theoretically, you can take that workflow to Mac OS. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so it might be just. <laughs> oh, it, this was mostly about the command line tooling. Yeah. I don't think you need Flatpak on a Mac because, for example, when I'm using my editor, and that's VS Code, by the way, um, using just like native installation on both or Flatpak on Fedora and just like native installation on the Mac, so that just works fine. So, as someone yeah. who actually does use a Mac and I flip around with virtual machines to do all of my work, one of the things that would actually probably help is, so Docker has this Docker for Mac thing, and what they do is they have a boot to Docker thing with a VM inside that bootstraps, and it, it, it integrates the Linux environment and reverse exposes it into the Mac terminal environment. So if you had like a Fedora brand and flavor of that, that, that would be amazing. Make it yeah, but network ministry has this. Yeah. 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 Ministry for Mac or ministry for Windows has to use have uh, a VM which is running in Fedora. Mm -hmm. Then you can actually do that because then Mac stores, whatever, even the Docker is running inside the VM. Yeah. Mac stores that and use uh, Fedora HDSP for uh, whatever the highest level you use this to over there. Just be less crappy because it's not a weird all time Linux tool that doesn't yeah, yeah. work correctly. <laughs> so, whether you use a mini ship or Docker for Mac, whichever one, you can still use a, you know, that containerized workflow that we've basically improved upon by more people using Silk and Boot and containerizing their workflows, right? Yeah. And also, it's not, sometimes it's not about making new code, but just making sure the one that exists works. So for example, I worked on the Fedora documentation build pipeline and we made sure I made sure that it builds on both Fedora and Mac OS and that was just like a little tweak to make sure it works on both. And now we can have people contributing from like much more user much more users. There's a hundred times more developers using Macs yeah. than there are using Fedora. Mm -hmm. So maybe, uh, I don't think it's a workflow, it's just like the mindset of just doing everything in containers, but yeah, I could start well, maybe well block series or something. It's possible yeah. that you can actually work and say, uh, I and you That's a good point. work this way, uh, so I uh, uh, don't hesitate to try it actually. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage people to use things like Fedora server a little bit more because mm -hmm. Yeah, cool, yeah. So if it was six minutes, just feel free to cut me off because I don't want to hold you there. But yeah, it would be cool if we have like few people interested and just like, I don't know, work on it, think about and just make something happen, that would be great. Okay, thanks. Thank you.